So welcome back to the European League Championship Series and we're here with none other than Crepo. We've heard from him before. Crepo, uh, we're getting a bit of time now, chilled out to ask you a few questions. First of all, how are you liking Cologne? Uh, I like it. We've been here a few times in the past, so I already knew I would like it. Um, like the setting of the ESL studios as well here. Uh, it's fun times. So what's the situation with EG in, in terms of living right now? There was, you know, Snoopy, I asked him for his address at some point on Twitter uh, to DM me and he sent me the, you know, publicly the address of the cathedral here in Cologne and everyone's like, oh, we shouldn't have done that. It's like, well, they don't actually <laughs> yeah. live at the cathedral. That'd be a nice house though, I suppose. Yeah, be big pretty, big, pretty big. Our so house how is it now? Smaller. Slightly smaller. <laughs> Only a little, a little bit. bit. So basically we have two apartments um, with three bedrooms each and one of the bedrooms slash living room is uh, oriented as a gaming room. So we'll have the possibility to stream in our own rooms, so everybody has his own room as well. And then we have this joint gaming room and like some, it's furnished apartment, the kitchens are all there. Like Every day we make food together with the five of us, as is like a team bonding experience. And then most of us clean up afterwards. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, it's very fun, I like it. It's a very cozy feeling and I'll look forward to living here. How, how much of a difference does it make to have your own room? Because you've had periods of time uh, in Korea, for example, I believe yeah. you were like in rooms together. How much easier is it to you know, be comfortable and live when, when you've got your own room? Because for me, I know I can, I can spend a week in a hotel room with Jason. It's a challenge, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's uh, happened but, already before. <laughs> you know, like three, four, five, six months, whatever, that's, that's a different story. Well, when you have a roommate like Yellow Pete, it's okay. I mean, he wakes you up, puts you to sleep, makes your food, cleans up, that's fine. But yeah, it's, it's definitely nice to have this, the, your own room because you can like, calm down, like, come to a rest there. It's your own private space and, and it's good to, to like, chill in, let's say. And, but yeah, it's not that big of a deal because we all like each other in our team. That's what we tell you at least. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, having a roommate uh, can get annoying after a while, but we dealt with it pretty okay. But it's definitely better having a room for your own. In, in terms of your, your joint gaming room, how do you guys really prepare without giving away anything uh, you know, for the matches coming up that week? Basically, we look at who we're playing the, in the weekend, and we don't scrim those teams, and then we scrim the other uh, LCS teams, possibly some non-LCS teams, but most, mostly LCS teams. And yeah, we just prepare. Uh, we look at what we're going to ban the weekend, and then we just ban that out against those teams. Um, they won't play the exact same way, but it'll mm -hmm. give us a bit of an advantage you know, going into the weekend. And then... Yeah, just play a lot, scrim a lot, try new stuff. Uh, doesn't matter if you win or lose. In the end, it's a scrim. You don't play full out. You don't put as much attention on your level one plays. Most of the time, we'll just go out, ward some stuff, and then start playing. And it just teaches you how to be like reactionary. Like, you, doesn't matter like what happens in the game as long as you know how to react to a situation. If five of you react to this uh, certain situation the same way, then you're on on point. Then you're in the, like, and uh, everything's aligned. Then and that's good. And uh, well, one more question, because I kind of want to talk about Thresh uh, you know, a little bit after, but you, know, you guys have been together for a really long time. Um, how does it really affect you guys in terms of that? Because you, you experience uh, you know, not, or things outside of game, as we were mentioning before, like the cooking. Um, it helps you guys bond together. How does it really affect you guys' you know, team play in terms of you know, fighting? Or sorry, not fighting, in, in terms of a team fight. Team fight, yeah. I noticed that the other day, actually, when we were playing a scrim, I think against Wolves or AAA, and they were contesting a Drake. And back in the day, we would go back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. But now we were at the right, at the left side of the rig. So we, they left their mid lane exposed. And back in the day, it was like one guy making that call, like, hey, guys, we can go mid. They left it exposed and push it. And now it was just, we just all naturally ran mid. <laughs> we were like, yeah, go mid, go mid, I agree. Yeah, let's go mid. And it just, it, it, not, it was noticeable that we were playing so long together and our mindset was completely aligned that we just did something without calling it. And that made me feel good. That made me feel like, a, like we had a team behind us. Yeah. Okay. And uh, going into this because it is like the, it's the really big news for the, for the week. It's Thresh. We saw him banned out, picked quite a bit already. Yeah. Um, actually, he's been banned or picked every game so far this week uh, in in Europe. What's your take on him? Because I know uh, if you guys were looking at Reddit, he did a one v two against a yeah. was it a Vayne Lulu co uh, combo? Yeah, I think um, the the gang potential with the lantern is is just insane. Like if we pony ganks, we call them when Hector <laughs> comes in, you just throw your lantern out, and even if the enemy sees you throwing it, it's too late because Hector just comes in, washes over the lane. Here's them, and they have to flash, or they're likely dead. So yeah, he might need some uh, some balancing, as Quitshot said earlier. <laughs> well, okay, going back to the lander just real quick before we move on into other things about him. Um, we were watching the recap of the day, and we, we saw Dynaprox on Nazus, and you were mentioning, you know, oh, yeah. he's it, with that lantern, it's impossible to escape a gank from him. Yeah, I played a game of solo queue with a jungle Nasus, and at first I was like, jungle Nasus, what is this? <laughs> oh, solo queue, move on. But I threw up my lantern, Nasus comes in, and he's in range of Wither, and he just uses it, and even if they flash, they're slow so hard that I just walk up 
slay them backwards, put a hook in their face, and, and they die. And it's, it's so beautiful. Do you think that opens up the game to new junglers? Just just that fact, if junglers have a really hard gap closer, a really hard time closing that gap, you, you pretty much facilitate that. Yeah, like these high mobility junglers, or junglers that like decrease the mobility of the enemy champions, become a lot more vi vi um, viable when mm -hmm. you play fresh, because it, it just redefines the entire like, definition of a lane gank because it's, like, the distance you travel in such a short amount of time is just insane. And uh, while we're talking about the junglers there, I mean, Volibear, he's made a, an appearance yeah. here in the, the LCS pretty much out of nowhere. Obviously, some teams were training that Volibear to bring him in there, but it's not like he was massively buffed or changed really in any way. It was just, okay, Volibear's there, and we're now seeing him 75% of <laughs> games. Why is that? Uh, I think it's a combination of the fact that he was just really strong champion as well, but nobody played him, and that he's, yeah. he's been used, like, if, if it's probably, I think it was Diamond Prox again who did it, yeah, like, yeah. every time it's Diamond Prox, comes <laughs> out with something, and suddenly everybody realizes, hey, this is good. I've seen uh, Morden from Giants play them as well in solo queue, and he's a real terror. I think, nowadays, the reason they play Volibear is because the jungle's getting a little more aggressive early. Like, mm. we've seen, it started with Vi, then Xin Zhao, and then the Kale as well, like, the really strong early junglers, and Volibear is one of them, and he, he, he managed to duel the other jungles in the jungle, and gank really well. So, yeah. Are there any others out there uh, without maybe giving away something that you guys have been secretly <laughs> training for down the line? I mean, are there any other volley bears out there? I don't think there are any like super hidden jungles we'll find, but we, we're definitely like training a few extra jungles now, like trying the, the little more aggressive playstyle. So uh, we'll see. So what about EG so far? Uh, and first I want to, without talking about your record, talk, uh, address something that Reddit's talking about a lot, which is EG games are not the most entertaining to watch, I'm going to put it that way. Um, why is that? Why do you think that people find your games, whilst you are obviously a very, very strong team uh, and you have all these wins to your name, why is it that your games for a lot of people aren't so entertaining to watch? Yeah, some might even call it boring. Uh, yeah. Your words, not ours. Yeah, definitely, definitely <laughs> no, I think it's because we have a very, very safe approach in laning. Like, if, when we play against teleports as well, we, we rarely get caught off guard. So we know all, all what's going into a game and we just take limited risks. And sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. But we just have a very, like, methodical approach to the game. We just slowly, slowly, like, uh, suffocate our victims rather than just putting a hammer on their head. Yeah. And, and I like that. I love that. I love that play style where you... was killing slowly. Yeah, when you just, <laughs> when you slowly take control of the game and you leave them no room to come back. Yeah, you'd be sure. We could take that second inhibitor or we could base, take it again, base again, take Nasher, <laughs> base again, push the third one, and just slowly... It's so beautiful when a game ends and everybody is live and all that's happening is the super minions are whacking away on the Nexus and it just tells you that you left them no room to come back. So let's talk a little bit about yesterday, uh, which not. you might not, <laughs> <laughs> which you might not want to talk about, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the game against Fnatic. Talk about what happened there and what, from your eyes, what went wrong for you guys? Um, I think definitely they came up with surprising picks. Let's hand it to them. Top lane Blitzcrank with Leona. Uh, generally, if they have like this one super aggressive champion, you can flash that. Like you can flash Leona ults, but, on, but the second we flash, the Blitzcrank comes in with mobility, flashes again, hooks, and it's really really good. I think we could have won that game with those picks still if we play the early game a little better. It's like stuff we don't really see that much because it happens off camera. It's, it's when we push the top tower, for example. If we managed to push that a little harder, it would have fallen earlier. Could have lane swapped, given Wicked some more farm. Wicked would be able to sacrifice himself on the hooks then. Because if they pull in a crocodile and, and Nivea still alive, full HP, and then we can start a team fight because our team fight was better than them because they only had two, two control CC bots and then two damage targets. We had more damage targets and a crescendo and an exhaust for Katarina. So we could have won that, but they played it so well. They exploited the advantages. They had pressure on everywhere on the map with the double teleport. And yeah, our communication wasn't aligned everywhere. Like one time Froggen walled off uh, at Drake, he walled off Blitzcrank and somebody else. But our intention was to wall them completely out and take the Drake and then split. Yeah. But he wanted to poke them because Anivia's kit is really good at walling off, putting a little poke on them. But that's fine unless they have an engage on you instantly after. And then it, yeah, it got dangerous. Uh, just well played by Fnatic, that's all I can say. Who are the danger teams to you in LCS? Obviously you lost to, uh, to SK, SK now yeah. and to Fnatic. Um, who are the real dangerous teams in this league? I mean, is it a case that every single one of these teams can actually beat you on the day? Or do you feel that there are really only a select number that can challenge you? Well, I will never go as far as saying on camera, hey, these teams can never beat me. Because I, <laughs> I've trashed out once uh, on camera and then Gosu completely destroyed me in my lane. So I'm not doing that again. <laughs> I was at Poland. Uh, no, I think SK, 
before we figured them out, really, they had this play style that went really well against us. I think we were a little bit better prepared by scrimming them. Um, Fnatic always does well against us in, in tournaments because they, they get this, they're very innovative. And you can never rule out Gambit either. Like yeah. It's Gambit gaming. They only need like they only need a finger and they'll take an arm. So they're really really strong. I just I just I just played against Wolves a few times and and like AAA Wolves, uh, Giants even. You can still see that they're a little inexperienced. Often they get strong laners and get a lead early, but they'll still manage to like not be able to push the advantage really well. And that's where we come in and we just calmly play the game and then just take the advantage back slowly and then we come out on top. Yeah, and, and as your team in general, what's your immediate goal right now? Is it just all about staying in the top of the brackets? Because currently, I believe you guys are second uh, by European, or is it first by European terms? Or <laughs> I, don't, I don't know exactly how that works out, but what's your immediate goal? Just to stay out of the relegation matches? I think the first half of the season, it doesn't matter that much. Of course, you want to be first and second, but I think it's all about expanding the champion pool, like making different play styles, uh, reading the teams really well, because at the end of the season, that's where it matters, mm -hmm. where, we, where you're fighting for those two spots for World Finals, probably, or three, I don't know, know the exact amount. But that's where it matters. For now, like yeah, it's fine being at the top, but it's also fine being in the middle and then improving. And you mentioned um, there the expanding champion pools, which is something that we, we've been noticing. Snoopy, I mean, we're used to seeing yeah. you know support junglers, but he actually played a jungle Kale once, and we were kind of taken by surprise right there. Is that part of that? Yeah. Well, obviously, no, obviously it is, but I mean, what else? Uh, is yeah, working he's with training that? some other junglers as well. You've see, you, you saw on the stream that he's playing a whole lot of volley bear, and now he's picking up other two junglers. I won't tell you which. You'll probably figure out if you watch his stream. <laughs> but then, hey, at least you're watching his stream then. Yeah. Shameless <laughs> plug. But yeah, uh, as as well as for me, I have like I'm picking up. I'm trying to play all the supports. Like in the past, you didn't really see me play that much Sona, and then I tried it, mm. and, and I was actually surprised by how how good the crescendo actually was in team fights, and relatively easy to land sometimes. So, and then Wicked, he went for the, the Akali pickup all of a sudden. Nobody expected that, and that worked for us. And we have so much time to scrim anyway, so why not try new stuff? We don't need to train Anivia anymore. <laughs> we barely need to train Lux, because like, we'll never get it. So, And we haven't really talked about this too much. Well, actually, I don't believe at all, but North America. W what do you think so far about that, with what's been going on? <laughs> Interesting subject. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they're, like, some say they're behind the meta. I don't know. Uh, I think the European average is stronger than the North American average, from what I can tell. Uh, I won't go as far as saying that every team in EU is better than NA, because you can't say that until the matches are played. Mm -hmm. uh, Curse is like doing really well there. They're like 6-0, I believe, right now. So yeah, uh, they're doing really well. Uh, CLG looking a little shaky with the lineup swap. But you, you can't tell anything until you're like six, seven weeks into the season. And even then, it's when the playoffs happen. Because you can lose, you can mess up now. Playoffs, you can still win it all there. Is there any teams in North America that you're looking out for specifically? Like, you know, hmm, they'll offer us a good challenge. Not, mm -hmm. not to call any teams out, but... I want to play against Curse again, because um, they're, always, they're, they're always like very touchy when it comes to saying that NA is uh, underrated, and they're the best team in there, but also they don't have a chance to really get even better, because if you're the best team in a single region, you won't get as much practice from playing. So right. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to somehow playing Curse one day. So... Talk about in your training schedule. We're kind of going back there a little <laughs> bit, uh, but that, I always wonder about this because I talked to Snoopy about it before. That, in my opinion, a lot of teams do it wrong with team houses in terms of sticking everyone in the house together and they're living together there every minute of the day together. They sleep together, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but you get you get the whole get thing. They're all in the same place constantly. Um, and I, I brought this idea to Snoopy that you know you have different houses, maybe a couple of guys living together and what have you, maybe some guys living alone, and then a central base where you, you know you really treat it as a job. Uh, so yeah. you say from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m., we You're work 12 hours a day, we come in there, the guy who's late gets a slap on the wrist, uh, and you know, maybe wages docked if that carries on, things like that. Um, how, what, what kind of s schedule do you have for training? Is it, is it very loose, as in, we're all awake now, let's scrim? Or is it... We're waking up at 10, we're playing for 10 hours, and that's it. We scrim a certain amount of hours a day. I think at the moment it's around average four or five. It's actually not that much, but if you do it properly, it's enough. It all depends on what kind of team you are. We're, we're pretty loose of a team. Like, we don't have a manager either. So, yeah. like, we've always managed ourselves. So, maybe that strict regime from, like, that hour and that hour isn't good for us. Because so far, it has been working for us. But maybe other teams need that to, to, get, profes like, to get more professional. But we've been in this for a year now. Like, we should be able to tell ourselves what we need. Yeah. And everybody's still motivated. We want to be the best. So obviously, we're not going to start slacking. And if somebody is, tell them. Discussion. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, shouldn't you be playing a little bit more solo queue? Or you played pretty poorly today. We don't mind that. 
I mean, it's obviously a hard decision, but that's, as you said, you guys have been together for, well, you tell me, how long exactly now? I think it's like team? 14 months right yeah. now. So Which is actually in an eternity, if yeah, you look at other line in the European scene. Line, scene, the European scene. Uh, you know, how long should a team, or how long does a team, I should really say, need to get, I mean, you look at some of the other lineups that we've got here in the European LCS, uh, that are fairly new, newly combined. How long does it take before you hit that level of, of trust and understanding with your teammates? Basically, it, it, it all comes down to when you have your first, like, big fight. Every team has those. Like, most of the European teams just broke up, like, back in the day when it was AAA, rotating uh, with some players every three months. Uh, we also had our fights like right before we went to Korea we were pretty close to maybe even breaking up at one point but like we, we leveled down we we're like hey guys this is our future like let's just put egos aside talk about like what's wrong get to the fundamentals and improve from there like we had plenty of time to improve we, we went into two months training in Korea and that's what really solidified us as a team spending like living that close quarters if you survive that as a team you're good to go because it can't get worse than being stuck in like this really small hotel room for like yeah. 12 hours a day, <laughs> nothing to do, like you don't speak the language, you go out and you just point at food, and you're like, yeah, that's what we want to get. We don't know what it is, but we'll try it. Lucky it, dip. Yep. But it was fun. It was an amazing experience. I love Korea, and just the, like the Asian scene, like the pro scene for, for gaming as well, and Taiwan as well. Oh, I love Taiwan. Want to go there again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you get a chance yeah. in the near future, who knows. Uh, but yeah, while we're on the topic of Asia, that kind of follows on where we were before, when I went back again, back to the whole training, re uh, training regime. The Asian scene, obviously, um, I kind of put them all together, even though you've got three major yeah, regions really there that ones. can be different as well. Um, but what do you think, I mean, we'll start off with the Koreans. The Koreans came into like the, the scene as, as the, the structured, like organized. They're, they were better because in StarCraft they're the best. But League's a team game, it's a little different. Uh, the, the super structured approach might not work for everybody, and everybody was nominating them as the, the number one teams, but then Gambit took them down in, in a recent tournament, and then they came into LCS, and then we took down Gambit, and somebody took down us, and it just shows you that everybody can beat anybody. And I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that they're overrated, though. They're really, really strong, but so are the Chinese, and then TPA is Taiwanese. Like. Yeah, they're 11-0 right now in the Season yeah. 2 GPL, so... They've destroyed everyone <laughs> once again. Uh, final question before we start to move it over to our next game. Um, what's it like to play on a stage like this? Obviously, the audience here in the studio is not so huge. You've been used to bigger audiences, yeah, that's for sure. Fine. The likes of CBA, Gamescom, where you've got thousands of people. But you know, it's a very homely atmosphere, I think we can say, here in the, in the studio. Uh, what's it like playing in front of that concentrated audience? It's, it's very cozy, in my opinion. It doesn't do much for like veteran players. It still gives a little nerves to like the newer players. You can still notice that. But it's fun. I like crowd. I like to interact with the crowd, even if it's like like two photos you take or, or three, it's still fun. It, it shows you that people still care. Like playing in just an empty studio wouldn't be my preference, for example. But it, I like it. Um, I wouldn't mind it being a little bit bigger, but of course, like you're, you're confined by, by the office space you have. And I think Riot and ESL did a good job getting the, the little stage out there, making it somewhat of a miniature tournament weekly. And definitely everybody should come check it out because it's, it's really fun. You can interact with all the pro players. Because we're just people too, like, don't be afraid to ask us for anything, because we love it. Like, let's face it, attention is fun. <laughs> <laughs> attention is fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we're back, obviously, in a little while to analyze the next game. But before we go to there, we asked a few of the other players what it's like to be playing on stage. When there's a crowd and the game is over, and if you actually win, it gives you, like, a huge boost. People are clapping at you, people, everyone is paying attention to you, the camera is on you. You just realized that, yeah, we're in front of a big crowd and hundreds of thousands of people at home watching this as well. Playing in front of a live audience is the ultimate challenge. Are you just good or can you prove yourself to be one of the best? I'm used to play like in my chair, in my room alone. So um, to see people share with me this passion, so this is a good experience. Spontex might be able to land the access, you know, teleport's gonna come in. Kuta's gonna get dropped, he will be Spontex taken out. To play their games in front of hundreds of thousands of people and have every single mouse click measured, it's a scary thing to do. No se puede jugar frente al público, es una motivación, es el hecho de que tú haces una jugada buena o tu equipo hace una jugada buena. Te motivas y sabes que el público va a responder y eso te hace venirte arriba y jugar mejor. The moments I feel crowd the most is, for example, like after the team fight, there's a cheering and yeah, if, if I have time, I can raise hand and yeah, just smile. For example, if we if we won the team fight, of course. 
It's not just that they're performing on stage. They have to give autographs, take pictures, chat with the fans. They're superstars, basically. When you get a kill, then you, you listen to the crowd, you are like, I want to do more, I want to do more. The heart is beating faster. The adrenaline just starts rushing through your way. We've done this so much, so the novelty wears off. And when we reached the point, actually, when we, we came to I Am Cologne, this was just another tournament for us, just another like tournament along the road, and we didn't really prepare for it, we didn't really care that much, and we got stomped. We played really poor, and that affected us, and that's, that was a wake-up call. Like, guys, this isn't just routine, you're playing for your fans, for the people out there, for your organization, you gotta take it serious. We found the joy in playing offline again, and it's still fun, like, when you make a good move, the crowd's cheering for you, like, right after the game, you take off your headset, you just look up, and they're all standing up, cheering, and that's probably the best feeling about gaming, winning and then having the crowd to interact. It's a really amazing feeling, like, you feel that you've done something really good and useful for whole team, for fans, which support you, and it's just awesome. I could, I can describe it. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Caster Desk. And what an amazing feeling it must be! Eh? Really, I mean, to stand in front of that crowd. I mean, I'm I'm thinking because I had I had the 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 great moment of casting the season two finals, and you know, for the for the likes of Taipei Assassins to be stood there with the cup, lifting the cup in the air, eight thousand people cheering their name in the uh, the Galen Center. It was, and, and another it, million and, online, and, and a million online. And what a, what an amazing feeling it was. And you even saw the video of of say the Taipei Assassins going back to the airport. They had crowds yep. at the airport cheering them, and that's what it is to be a pro player. And you know, these players that are in the League of Legends Championship Series, they're all looking to be that next they're team. They're on that road. They're on that road. You know, this this series, this championship, is going to get the next team, the next ultimate heroes in the League of Legends. And you know, we're going to have those uh, World Finals later on in the year. But before we get to that, we've got more games today. We do have more games today, and well, the teams have been preparing themselves. So let's see who is going to be playing for them. It is going to be Fnatic versus against all authorities, and there he is, so as he was MVP yesterday. Fantastic performance by him. Cyanide, X Peke, Yellow Star, and Enrated potentially could have been MVP as well. Yeah, so true. His Leona in both games was just yeah. so, so powerful. Against all authority, though, Freddy 1-2-2, a virtual Schleyer. No, no, his Ezreal yesterday was amazing. It made us break out into song, and you know he's going to be trying to do that again today. And, of course, Corellius on the support. He does have his own personal anthem now. And actually, all credit to our crew. They were playing the song to him earlier on. He was enjoying it. He during, was enjoying during it. During rehearsals, we were revisiting our song moment yesterday in no, the sound, no, guys. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> breaking it out so for good us. good on them and uh, you know the player he, he enjoyed it he enjoyed yeah, exactly. his moment in the in glory and that's of what course, really and this is all about getting those yeah of course the, <laughs> the, li the little wave that no no did if you've not seen it standing alongside shocks that's a slightly awkward moment but maybe it won't be so awkward this time because you know to get in that position to be talking to shocks of course you've got to win the game Correct. and will they do it against fanatic the pressure is on, but I think they have the ability to do so. You know, if we have a look at the roster for the, the team, it is, of course, against all authority. And Nono is such a strong player. And right now, we're going to look at, of course, his opposite number, though, Yellow Star. And Yellow Star yesterday, his misfortune was on point. He was kept alive by the rest of Fnatic. It was Cyanide's interventions that kept him alive. Keeping him fed, of course, so as setting him up for kills, etc. So Fnatic did very, very well in that setup. And they're going to try to replicate the success of yesterday. Yeah, and Yellow Star, of course, so good that he's qualified twice for Europe and with SK Gaming and now Fnatic seems to be their star man but of course against all the authorities they have the man in the middle he is Schleyer he is the highest KDA member of the team and can he carry against all authorities to victory he's going to be up against Peke in that mid lane to start with it's going to be a tricky one. Against the expeccable uh, expeccable, I think was what we uh, threw out there yesterday. It's going to be a difficult task, but if anybody's up to it, it is going to be Schley. He's been around for such a long time. Former and teammate of Crepo and, and Snoopy, of and course, in, in, in La GG, I believe it was. Talking about former teammates and players, a lot of the Fnatic players used to play for against all authority. They did, yeah. I still remember their team Yellow manager. Yellow star and rated. And so is, as well. I yeah, remember Harry running around calling him Fnatic with three A's in the middle <laughs> of the name. You know, it's, it's quite... An he got his match. wish eventually. He did, he did. He did. And as always, of course, we did get a chance to catch up with the teams earlier on. So let's get a chance and look at what they said. AA hey, is one of those teams I don't know anything about. I'm really scared about them. They might be really good. I'm not really scared because maybe I have 
a good feeling with all of the players, as human, not as players, so they make me feel confident. The team itself is quite solid. Schleier is a really good mid player. They can really find these miracle spots to like just take games from people. That's the really very dangerous against them. They will yeah be ahead of most of the European teams, but we will see if the training will work will work out for them or not. And it's interesting to hear Henry to talking about the training of against Royal Authorities. Joe touched on it yesterday. They have been in this studio training so hard yep. over the last two weeks against Royal Authorities. They have been burning the midnight oil here, and they seem very comfortable there. You can see the big grin on the face of Nono. They have definitely been working hard for this matchup, and, well, Fnatic are definitely a tough opposition. We saw them beating out Evil Geniuses last night. Very strong performance from them. So against Royal Authorities, you're going to have to be on top of their game if they're going to take them down. And I'm wondering how well prepared Fnatic are for this matchup today. You know, they had three games this weekend over the course of the two days and Cyanide <laughs> there with the <laughs> fist pumping. You know, how well have they prepared for a team that they haven't seen all that much of? I believe this is the third game in the LCS 4 against All Authority. And, you know, without having that wealth of information and all those games to draw from, what do you do? We are into the picks and bans. Lux, Thresh, Shen and Kale removed. So, so far, one 100% picked or banned for Thresh in the EU LCS. Yeah, and it's expected, honestly. We saw the fantastic performance yesterday. It worked so well for yeah. Edward, so every, suddenly everyone's like, oh, okay, we're going to ban that. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to let anyone else have that. And, you know, a player like N-Rated certainly could have picked that champion up. He hasn't given anything away And so has been playing him in the top lane as well. On yeah, hits, uh, this, this is what we were talking about exactly. yesterday. We had a discussion, Wicked was involved as well, and we talked about how it's possible that Thresh can be used as a top laner. I'm just waiting for the moment it actually comes out. Shin Zhao being another band there. And the final one, well, who is it going to be? We'll find out in a moment. We're waiting to see what Fnatic are going to start with. Of course, we had the Blitzcrank of Soaz yesterday. Will they pull anything crazy like that out, I wonder? The thing about that particular composition as well, it, it was a clearly well thought out game yes. plan from Fnatic. They got every champion that they really wanted to get and they played it very, very well. You heard Crepo during his interview saying that it was the way that they played the engagement. It was the fact that they, they got that advantage mm and they managed to steamroll it away. The final ban was, in fact, Vi. So they're getting rid of that champion, removing it either from the jungle or, in, in Dragonborn's case, the mid lane. And Fnatic have locked in Volibear. So how will they counter this? Will we see Sona being locked in? Tends to be a standard one for Corellius. Um, and talking about the bear, though, against all authority, faced, it, faced the bear yesterday. Mm. All right, it was in the hands of uh, the Copenhagen Wolves. They had the, the volley bear, the singed combo, and they know how to play against it. They're currently sitting on Sona, which is that standard sort of safe pick. You know, you pick your jungler, you pick your support, and then you build your composition around that It's also the pick that Corellius always goes for. Yes, exactly. I mean, I don't think I've seen Corellius actually play anything other than Sona Both yet. games that he's played. Yeah. Two Sonas, average KDA, 3.1. But I, I even see him in solo key. Every time I walk past, he's playing Sona. I don't know if he plays anything else. With, with the arcade skin. Every with single the arcade skin, of course, Arcade yeah. Sona is the way that he goes. Uh, talking Shogath about that as well. being picked up, actually, here in the jungle. There's something we haven't seen a great deal of. We saw him in the first week pretty much constantly picked and then the second week and the third so far it's just completely forgotten about and again bringing it up with uh, the choker pick the copenhagen wolves Sven yes. scaring random in the jungle his early game wasn't necessarily the strongest but once they started getting to those team fight picks his ruptures were just so on point oh, they wanted disruption. and rated has got his leona though that's a scary thing it's the same bot lane that they ran against evil geniuses yesterday yeah that misfortune was very very strong for yellow star Handling over Poppy, I don't think they're going to go for Poppy. Three teleports for Fnatic right now. So a little bit of mind games in the summoner spells. Teleport Flash, Teleport Smite, Teleport Flash. I'm expecting it to I change. I think they're going to change I'm that, expecting yeah. it to change, but there's a tiny little percent in me that's thinking, well... It'd be nice. They ran Teleport Smite Volley Bear yesterday, if I remember correctly, in the first matchup of the day against the Wolves. You know what? Maybe they're going to put four teleports, five teleports in a game. Yeah, we do see a potential picks out. Varus is possibilities. Renekton would make sense as well. There's been very strong picks earlier on. Obviously, we've seen Darian running a very strong Renekton, so we could see whether the top laner Freddy wanted to. Has, of course, reigned AP Kennen last week as Correct. well, if I recall. So yep. definitely pulls out some interesting picks. 
there is Cannon once again. May well get chosen. Now, the Lux was banned out first. That was banned from Fnatic. In week one, or week two, game one for against Authority, they ran Lux in the middle lane and they ran Cannon in that top lane. So they had that double AP comp and they, they built towards ability power. With Lux being removed from the pool, I want to know what AAA decide to round out their composition with. But in terms of a couple of champions that are still available, Kha'Zix is there, Twisted Fate is there. There's a number of champions that we've seen and have been up at that top tier. But really, what does you know Fnatic want to play? We've effectively, in theory, got the jungler and our bottom lane. So it's literally the last two solo lanes that need to be locked in for Fnatic. So let's see what they're going to be. We've seen... Kate uh, Katarina being selected yep. many times by Peke. Obviously got the snowball on them with that one. I think Peke played Katarina twice mm -hmm. yesterday. KDA of 27. That's okay. not bad. That's 27 not bad. KDA with an average gold per minute of 423. Now, to be fair, both games were fairly one-sided. So but it, that's, that's his that's plays skewed, that make that. But that's exactly yeah. it. It's those things. And it does look like it's actually been swapped out. It's been a while since we've seen Diana, and I actually mentioned it yesterday as well. Uh, Peke's Diana is very, very good, but the question is, has he been practicing it and scrimming it in those solo queue games? Well, Dirty Diana is strong once again <laughs> in 3.02, and there is the Malphite pick, something that Soaz used to run all the time in that top lane, so kind of falling back on an old setup here, our Fnatic. Yeah, it, it's true, and again, it's heavy, heavy engage. You've got every single one of the champions wants to dive in, pick a fight, pick an engagement. You're going to have Diana dive again, throwing the moon fall, pulling everybody together. You're going to have Unstoppable Force knocking everyone up. While all of that's going on, bullet time is going to be happening. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very aggressive comp. There are currently five teleports for Fnatic, so I'm waiting for those to get swapped out. You and never it, know. They it, might just yeah, be piling you, in. You, you never know. And currently, AAA hovering over Jarvan. Well, we do see Jarvan 4. Is he going to get locked in? Which would make it a mid lane, possibly, Kenan? Could it be mid lane Cho'Gath? <laughs> it, it could even be... It could be mid lane Jarvan. It could be mid lane Jarvan. It could be mid lane Jarvan. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jarvan possibly in the jungle, Cho top and Kenan mid. That would be my assumption. And I think that we'll see if this is going to play out. At the moment, though, it's Jarvan top and... Uh, well, they're well, going to swap. They're going to swap. There's, there's a minute on the clock. Some of the spells are changed for Fnatic, though, but it does look like Cyanide is going to be using his Teleport Smite, which is what he pulled out against the Wolves yesterday. It's going to be AD Cannon, and I think it is going to be Slayer in the middle. And I think, actually, as it stands right now, is probably the position it will stay in, which is going to be Freddy 1-2-2 two, two on Renekton. We have 25 seconds, so they could switch him around at any moment. However, the Fnatic team is definitely going to stay that way. What are we seeing between these two team compositions? There's so much pressure on Slayer right now because his Cataclysm is going to be instrumental in keeping people away. You do that the wrong place. From, Your team doesn't like you. That's it. But the problem is that ability... While, yes, it's going to lock people inside. Oh, in the last second, there's a swap. Two seconds on the clock. Schleyer has got AP Cho'Gath in the middle, and Virtual has been given Jarvan for the jungle. Mm. Okay, so they've done that last second swap. It is going to be an AP Cho against Diana, and I think I prefer that matchup a little bit more. If Diana goes aggressive, you can just knock her up when she lands on you. She is a melee champion after all, and silence her and effectively just walk away. If that Crescent Slash is on, it should buy you enough time for it to wear off and prevent her diving onto you again. Now, what I was trying to get at with uh, Jarvan's ultimate, Diana can dash. Uh, you've got Leona that's going to pull herself onto you with the Zenith Blade. You've got Malphite that can dash forward. Jarvan is going to have to wait until all of those movement-based abilities have been used and then lock everybody in and put the crescendo over the top. If he is early or late, they are simply going to dive over those walls and it's not going to be effective at all. Well, we can see Soaz hasn't loaded in yet, so that's where you're seeing the players on your screen that will be sorting out at the moment. The admins will be hot on the case, and there is against all authorities. Schleyer, Nono, and Corelli as near as the screen. There's Cyanide. He's looking pretty much ready and waiting, pretty pretty calm, cool and calculated, and there is the admin with Soaz, his computer at the moment. Now, you know, we talked about, you know, we just saw the video of how it is to play live. I wonder how it is as these pro players, if something goes wrong with the machine, how much it disrupts you? Well, I imagine the momentum that you build up is really difficult. You mm. know, you sit there and first of all, you start getting anxious and nervous towards your game, towards the matchup as you're watching the, the previous game. This is game number two of the day. Then all of a sudden you get hyped, you get that adrenaline, you, you're about to load in and, you know, hoo-ah, let's do this. And there's just this stall. 
of any of the teams, you know, some uh, a team like Fnatic has been around literally the entire world. They've played at so many tournaments. I imagine they will know how to deal with this. You can see Cyanide and Peke, they're grinning, they look relaxed, they look comfortable. But over on the AAA side, they're a little more anxious. Their faces tell a slightly different story. And this is only their third game of the LCS. We watched a video of them yesterday where they said, you know, they haven't really trained offline together. This is the first time they've truly... He doesn't look too flustered as he so has. He doesn't really look that bothered by this. He's just like, meh, oh well. Things happen. <laughs> I mean, the guy was so calm, cool, calm, and collected yesterday. He played Blitzcrank top lane. That's that's not something we've seen, no, really. No, not at all. And the number of hooks that he landed, max range yeah. hooks, you know, really, really crucial. You need to land those skills if you're going to get anywhere. And, you know, he managed to do so. So it was well played. We are just trying to get this uh, PC issue resolved as quickly as we can. So let me take a quick look at the lanes and, of course, the summoner spells for each. Freddy 122, Renekton against Soaz is Malphite. Both champions running Flash Ignite. Malphite generally does well against auto attack bruisers. He's got the ability to slow their attack speed. He can get the melee off him with the seismic shards, etc. So I'm expecting Soaz to do relatively well and control the lane unless Freddy 122 gets a very good early advantage. Well, Freddy's saying he's a click ahead of Soaz. He's got this in the bag. He's, he's happy. <laughs> he's managed to move that little bit forward. You can see the screen pause there just to the lefty view cyanide. Just He's pretty relaxed. It's, it, he's falling asleep, to be honest. He I wants think, to right get there. to this game. He wants to get into this matchup right now. Cyanide, of course, he is <clears> playing <throat> Teleport Smite Volley Bear. Now, he ran that against the Copenhagen Wolves in the first game of the day yesterday, if I remember correctly, it was the second game. But nevertheless, uh, it was Fnatic's first. Mm -hmm. To be 100% honest, his teleport, while it helped, you know, get those early ganks, I think outside of the first use, it wasn't all that instrumental. It wasn't needed to be game-changing because they got so far ahead so early. Well, you say that, but he went and got a 1v1v uh, yellow peak. Uh, no, of course. Okay, but he was moving towards that way. My point is, it wasn't completely game-changing because they were so far ahead. Yeah. So it was something, and we've seen even the double teleport out of Fnatic. They used it a couple of times, but it wasn't... Again, they didn't teleport back to a tower and, and get to safety. There weren't those massive, massive swings in momentum thanks to the ability to use. But what would you take otherwise? I mean, flash is kind of not really needed. I mean, you can flash and flip. Whenever I see these super, super aggressive junglers, the exhaust smite is something we see out of some of them. You know, mm. with mobilities, Lee Sins, for example, even Shaco's in solo queue. And when you've got a Renekton, a Jarvan, a Ken, and even, you know, AP Cho, once he starts getting some items, I think that exhaust would be so useful. If they start to fall behind, that can help you win team fights, whereas a teleport's only going to give you map presence. That's not going to help you win the fight. It'll get you to the fight quicker, but if you're behind, you're still going to be behind, if that makes sense. So we're just waiting for the guys to sort themselves out. You can see the teams keeping calm, having a chat. That's Corellius up on your screen. Cyanide's still looking very calm. Every time we go to him, he's just twiddling his thumbs, One, really. two, three, four. I declare a thumb <laughs> war. <laughs> <laughs> My word. Passing back to school. No matter what nation you're from, it's still the same school game. Of course, yes. While still, still yawning from Cyanide, some would think that maybe maybe he needs to get some sleep before he plays his games. I don't know. Get, get some energy drinks in him. I'm sure he'll be okay. Uh, in terms of the rest of these lanes, Diana Chogath. Again, we've talked about it. Super, super aggressive. Chogath has the ability to stop Diana, knock her up, silence her, walk away. On the other side, if he lands that combo, once you get a few points in it with some ability power, they hit really, really hard. Well, we are seeing Peke. Peke, of course, in that mid lane. Diana versus Chogath. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, we've seen actually before lanes switching around. Is this, is this a possibility that they could be jumping the lanes around over here? I mean, Renekton, Malphite, nah, I think they'll probably be okay with that. Do you think we're going to maybe see no and Corellius try and force a 2v1? I don't know which team would be more likely to do it because both have the ability to do it relatively well. You know, that Granite Shield from Malphite will help survive some of the early poke. Renekton's got such good sustain with his Cull the Meek. And it's something that we know Fnatic are very happy to do. You know, yesterday in their matchup, I still even remember seeing some tweets from Wicked saying, I can't wait to fight Soaz. You know, I, I want to trade it. Let's see if you'll be brave enough to do it. And he went, nope, I'm playing Blitzcrank. I'm playing a team fight. I, I don't want to fight. I don't want to go 1v1. They swap lanes and Fnatic responded, nope, I don't want any of that. You know, they played the map, they played the team comp. So if it's what Fnatic feel or think will be, you know, good for them, then I, I think they're probably going to do so. I believe that Freddy would probably have a slightly easier time of it if he does get 
you know, dived on by Leona, he can just slice and dice away, get his health back. Whereas if some stuns and some poke come down from Kennan and Sona, it's a bit more difficult for Soas to stay alive in these early opening levels. Well, I mean, we even saw Wicked tweeting out yesterday the fact that, you know, he's so much so he avoided the 1v1 that he sent 14 members to kill me. <laughs> because obviously five members of Fnatic all piled in there and took the turret. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, it's just... If, if Fnatic think it's going to play into their game plan and their strategic play, definitely. I think they're going to you know, go for that matchup. But it's, it's an interesting comp. Um, we're still just trying to get this, this issue resolved as quickly as possible. And you know, there's a lot of pressure on against all authority. It's their third game here at LCS. And they're still trying to find their stride. Find their stride. And of course, we have uh, Yellow Star talking French to them. Because, of course, against all authorities, four members of the team are French and just the one Englishman in there, Freddie Want to do. We're just waiting to see where whether they're gonna get going. You can see the chat. You can see Cyanide chatting away there. There there is a lot of banter going in between the screen. If only you guys could see what goes on. They've all got smirks on their face, so you can uh, imagine that it is it's actually I think they're playing hangman. <laughs> I think the teams were playing <laughs> hangman. That would explain it. I was trying to understand what the underscores were yeah. a moment ago. But yes, they they are playing hangman. Slayer has asked if it's an eye in the game and they're gonna get some responses out there. But hey, hey, hey there's smiles on the team now. The it's next level Slayer's doing there. You can see him <laughs> typing, he's actually doing hangman. <laughs> no no huge giggles and laughs there, you know. It's good to see because initially I, I was getting a bit nervous for the team. They were looking a bit a bit nervous, a bit, you know, tense and now it's all smiles. Well they're trying to pull out the umlas uh, the different 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 yep. types of letters and the is it going to be X Peck? You know, it's got it's five letters and it ends with a T E. I'm a little bit worried because it starts <laughs> with an S now. It could be uh, yes, <laughs> state of course. That's of course what it is. That's that's what they were aiming for. You can see the chat flowing just about on Peke's screen there. It's just streaming up the side there, uh, but. Uh, Sweet, sweet was sweet, the word. Sweet could work I, as well. I, I was thinking it may have been something else, but S blank blank T E. It could have been anything. Leave, leave, yeah, leave it to your imagination. Let's let's not go down that road. <laughs> I leave it to everybody's imagination. There's Soaz, of course, he's still... You can see the referee just to the side there sorting out this problem, but... It's interesting. I'd love to get a word from Crepo if we could, you know, of how, how the teams really are sorted out in this position, you know, if, if they were in this position when they get the pause, because... Evil Geniuses are the team really more than anyone that have had this situation. They had to wait around for seven hours. I had to talk for seven hours, unfortunately. All they had to do is sit there singing. Um, but whether we'll, uh, whether we'll be able to get that, I don't know. As it stands at the moment, we do see on your screens the players continuing to wait with that pause. Wait, it's a best of three or a best of five. The teams are busy asking with the delay as, you know, We'll, we'll get this sorted as quickly as, as possible. It's, it's probably just one of the PCs uh, uh, as, as we're waiting to get it sorted. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we will get this game underway relatively soon, I hope. Relatively soon. Yeah, I mean, we're just waiting to see. We do see Peke. Look at that. Intense focus. What did, what did Joe call him yesterday? The most photogenic player, I think. That was it. Something it, like it, that. Um, extremely photogenic ex -peke, you know, <laughs> running back to the meme from last year. And to be fair, it was a good photo. It, it was a very good photo. He was looking fantastic there. And they're even quoting now the uh, Summoner's Code as well, Graceful actually. Graceful in victory, humble in defeat. There are uh, the Summoner's <laughs> Code going out. <laughs> Is that your dream? It's good to see that, you know, the camaraderie between the teams has actually built up, and, and we've talked about this a few times. The fact that you know we're into week three, um, I expect to see probably quite a few teams members going out, enjoying the nightlife. I think it's safe to say of Cologne. Um, slowly but surely, the teams have been more and more members going out, and, and they're they're mixing very well. It's really nice to see. It's it's a healthy competitive nature. You know, yeah, everybody. They respect one another as opponents, and everybody wants to win. They, they want to take out their opponents, and they want to climb that ladder. But at the same time, they also understand that everybody's here, you know, competing, playing the game that everybody loves. So it is great to see, and uh, you can just see it. Like, these guys are playing hangman. During a delay, during a pause, there's a little <laughs> bit of banter back and forth. They're having some fun with it, and uh, they're even taunting one another just a little bit right now.
Yeah, zero Tensona Inc. is uh, what they're saying. That's actually uh, signaling towards Corellius. Corellius was playing uh, solo queue earlier on. I think he was zero seven. I think or something like that. He was he was rage typing. Let's put it that way. Frustrated. I think he was frustrated. I think it's fair to say everybody's been in that situation at one point or another. But but when you're in that situation and there's two supports like Crepo and Enrated stood behind you, taunting you. It's a little frustrating, I think. <laughs> it gets your blood boiling just a tiny <laughs> bit more. Just a tiny bit more. But nevertheless, they are hopefully, you know, going to keep themselves together. I wonder what it does for the team, knowing now, you know, the preparation, the build-up to the game. You discuss so many things. You discuss your strategy, what your picks, what your bands are. Now you're in here, you've got to pause for 10 minutes, and you know the enemy composition. You know what's there. I wonder how much of this time is being used for strategic talk. Do we want to try this? Do we want to go here? Do we want to do that? You know, um, it's also another question that we can throw for Crepo when we eventually jump over to him later. You know, what do you do during these pauses in a situation like this? The opening seconds of a game, and now the strategic plan is laid out before you. Well, as it is, we can see the still the grins, the back and forth, the banter keep going. I, if, if only we could tell you what they were saying. As it is, they seem seem very happy. So hopefully, um, what we're going to do is pass over, hopefully, to the analyst desk and maybe get some words with Crepo because Crepo is the fine person. You know, the fact that he, like we say, the, the evil geniuses versus Team WE situation he had where they had this pause for so, so long. And hopefully we can grab a word with them if, uh, if, if the director is listening to me. Well, we are here. Are we? Are we here? I don't know. We that's are. the question. Okay, so we're here, apparently. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's lovely. Uh, so, Crepo, it's not quite seven hours yet, but how much does this kind of pause affect you at the start of a game? At the start, it's fine. Coming into hour four and five, that's where the mental break point really goes. But <laughs> at the start, it's, it's fine. Uh, so, did you guys think about playing Hangman to maybe relieve a little bit of that pressure as things went on? Well, basically, it's, it, most of the time, especially in the European scene, it just, it's just banter and all chat. Like, at the start, I was like, why don't they show the all chat? It's like, adds a little flavor. But as time progressed, I'm like, no, they better not show this all chat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a really good that all the teams get along really well, so you can throw a little bit of banter back and forth, maybe like taunt them a little bit. But other than that, yeah, you just try to remain calm. Like you have a type of players who are very nervous and they, they start like shaking their seat, adjusting their keyboards like 17 times, everything has to be perfect. And then you have players like like you saw Cyanide who just doesn't care, who just sits there. Falling gets, asleep. <laughs> yeah, dozes off and out, game starts and he's good to go. And yeah. I think we can. We, I, we, I guess we've got a bit of time here to actually talk about uh, the lineups that we've got. Your favourites and Wavi. So Fnatic, obviously Malphite, Volibear, Diana, uh, Miss Fortune, Leona, and against all authority, Renekton, Jarvan, Cho'Gath, Kennen, and Sona. What do you think to the match up here? It's very hard to judge um, like who's going to come out on top. If if it's a straight like concentrated team fight, Fnatic wins because the Malphite is undodgeable, gets instantly followed up by Leona. Like Diana jumps in, ease them in again. Like meanwhile. Volibear flings whoever gets out back into the puddle and then MF is just doing bullet time and it's 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 like the curse of the sad bullet time with a Mumu, but this is even like more AoE centered. Then again if AA spreads out, like Renekton ease out one way, Kennen ease out the other way, Sona Crescendo comes in, stops them from following up, or Jarvan like dunks the MF mid ulti and stops it. It can turn around. Like, I think AA, AA has to be together, yet spread. They can't get fully AoE'd, but they have to be ready to follow up instantly. And uh, for Fnatic, it's all about picking that one target off. They, like, they, they call somebody out, like, hopefully they hit Leona ulti hits like one or two targets, and they see, see the guy down, and if it's instantly 4v5, like, doesn't matter what lineup you have, you're like 4v5, you won't win that fight. So it'll, it'll very, it's a very skill-based matchup. If you go into lanes, I think I, think I really like the Cho'Gath pick against Diana, because it, I think it works really, really well. Uh, I'm not too sure about who beats uh, Renekton against Malphite, but I think Malphite will probably go for the 1v2. Uh, and just try and survive that way. And I, I kind of want to look at the jungle a little bit because we talked about Volibear, we talked about Sina in particular, running the teleport smite. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that, at least your experiences with it? Basically, th it means that you have to bring a pink ward to lane. Pick, like, not necessarily the first level, but come in at 4 5 after your first base. They will sneak in a, br a brush ward behind you, mm -hmm. and that means at any time. A bear can pop up behind you and come and kill you and fling you back <laughs> comes in. Comes out of the forest. Yep. And it's it's really, you have to be aware of where the wards go. So every time Leona comes to the lane, ta I'll tab, check the wards in their inventory, and then start counting. When they get placed, time them. Mm -hmm. How long do they last? And then count a pink ward one spot, and then stay a little bit away from the other spot. So when he comes in, you can see the particles. On the other hand, he doesn't have a flash, so he's, he's if he gets caught in the jungle, he might die because he can't escape. Jarvan's really good at hunting. Um, 
I think the Jarvan will focus a lot on shutting the Diana down in mid because she's melee range against the Cho'Gath. The knockup from Jarvan might give him enough time to land that rupture, follow up silence, and they're both in melee range. They can whack away and kill her. So, yeah, it, it, I think this is entirely this entire game will be purely skill matchups. Yeah, you, you talked about Jarvan a little bit there, but what do you think I mean, overall? Because he kind of came back into the scene. I mean, we saw Frog and play him in the mid lane quite yeah. a bit, but now he's finally back in the jungle. We see, saw him playing it quite a bit. And and any, how do you feel about him just overall? Um, it's a champion we've actually rarely played on jungle. Um, I, I always felt that in the jungle he was a little weak because he's quite squishy and, and he might, if he doesn't get a good start, like he's pretty much useless. But then again, he's, he's good at shutting down one lane, he can get over the ledges. I, I think the Koreans I saw a few times as well just using Jarvan, just going over, passing ward spot, and then suddenly he's behind you. If, if you land that flat combo really well, then it's good. But it's also good in team fights if you combine him with a Tarek. Like, I think Curse did that one game, they fought an all-physical lineup. It was fine. Give me Jarvan, give me Tarek, double armor aura, and they're, they're doing fine. And also some shred on the queue, I believe. So, it's a very, very niche champion, in my opinion. And it's 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 really beautiful to see, like, good Jarvan play. <laughs> <laughs> so what about level one? Because you, you are actually one player that I've noticed doing this a lot more than others, especially on the blue side, is that pink ward straight away on the top side of the river. Mm -hmm. um, what does it bring you to, you know, obviously when you see where their ward goes down, to get rid of that straight away? Is it, uh, I mean, how much worth does that bring to your team in the early stages? Basically, level one, you, most of the teams want uh, roughly like on average two wards on a map. You, you often place your like minute ward somewhere like to predict an invade, and then at the other side you'll place a three minute ward. But why not make that a pink ward if you can kill like an enemy ward at the same time? It tells them, yes, we've been watching your games, we know where you ward, you did it again, and we had a pink ward ready. Like, it messes with their head. They might be wanting to invade there, but they can't anymore because they don't know if you're in the brush or not. Yeah. Like, pink ward mind games is, is something fun, especially in solo queue as well. If you, if you, it's, it's a sense of pride. You go to dragon, you pink it, the guy comes back, he pinks it, pinks it back, then I, I just tell Pete, this guy just started a pink ward war. I'm gonna win it. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, like, some, somebody flips and buys an oracle, and that's when it starts. And yeah, well, it's what we do to keep busy, you know, supports. That's the, that's the, the mini <laughs> game that support players play between themselves. And, you know, when they have their specific uh, support only meetings where they sit around and talk about the state of the support game, yeah, uh, that's why they, you know, they really bring those bragging rights out who's killed more pink wards this year uh, as a whole. Uh, but what about level one? You know, we talked about the wards and what have you. Do you think we'll see much action there? Um, yeah. They can. I mean, Malphite's not the best invader. Like, they're all pretty short range. Uh, if Volberg gets a fling into Leona stun, they can. Um, I think uh, I think a lot of teams will just spread, and they maybe they do a delayed invade on one buff. If we see a lane swap happening, that might mean that there's four people at one side of the map combined compared to the other three people, so you're stronger in the area, and that a lot of teams use that advantage to force either jungle away from a buff or steal a buff and then collapse into your own red jungle, for example. It's, it, it's considered, I think, the safest thing because uh, when we were at World Finals, that's where every team was doing really, really heavy level one stuff. And if you do the math on it, doing a, a delayed invade with like four people often is the best option because it secures you one buff. Like you won't be 4v5 unless they really read you like a book, but then yeah. props to them, they outplayed you. <laughs> you. You go for like at worst, what, a 4v4, possibly a 4v3, they're tanking the blue buff, they're su they get surprised. And if you like delayed invade one buff, you can collapse on your other one and you will always get two buffs. And if you get two buffs, then you, you're good to go. You, you just don't want to lose, like, you don't want to lose, like, free buffs, because back in the day when people were really super passive, some teams figured it out, I was like, they're doing the same all the time, like we were. We got our, our red buff stolen once by an Ezreal Q. You know that feeling? That's not a good feeling. Well, well like, your game Gamescom. against SK, yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. It was, like, a prime example of, you know, yeah, buff they, control. They, they do free buffs level one. We should have never let that happen. Alistar walked in. We even saw him coming in. Like, their strategy revolved around an Alistar walking into our blue buff alone and smite stealing. 50-50 smite stealing. <laughs> Shouldn't happen, right? No, that's our mistake. That's, well, pretty, pretty ballsy play by them, I, could, I guess you could say. And it worked for them, so there's, like, I can't call it a bad play because they beat us. But it was really risky, and, and yeah, we got caught off guard. It's that when we realized, like, guys, we're doing smiteless all the time. That's no good. Change it up. Are there any, um, yeah, at level one, are there any weak spots that a lot of teams that you've noticed, you know, not really uh, either using to the best of their ability where there's definitely uh, an opportunity there? Or, uh, you know, on the other side, any areas where you think teams are too heavily defending, too heavily warding maybe even? I think we're, uh, yeah, there's a few spots on the map that just, it, it all depends. If you analyze teams, check their replays, they fall into patterns. 
but I think we're about good to go. I just heard that uh, that Soas just reconnected on the screen, so I think we're going to toss it over back to Lee and quick shot, and he's going to take over. Well, thank you very much, Crepo. Crepo passing over to us there. So <laughs> like we are hopefully about to get in the way. Crepo, of course, has done commentating before. So uh, it's a, he's a veteran at this, maybe now. But uh, he did it in Scottish accent before as well, which is a little strange. But, you know, when you're hanging around uh, he's not Scott, Scottish? like Snoopy for, for long <laughs> enough, you, you tend to absorb it. So here we go. The pause is finally removed, and we are underway. It was a 40-minute pause there. So that has to play into the hands of one of these teams. You'd think Fnatic would be the better suited for it, but both teams had a good bit of banter going on there, and even N-Rated said, well, my hands are warm now because he's been typing the entire time. Yeah, well, I, I didn't actually see who won the hangman. That that, that was the important <laughs> question. <laughs> well, it was Slay was, was the hangman master, I think, potentially, so I'm not sure how that works out. But we are underway, ladies and gentlemen, and if you have just joined us, well, you missed a 40-minute delay and some expert, expert analysis from Kropo on the analysis analysis desk. That's a lot of analysis in one word. That's <laughs> impressive. But the blue team is Fnatic. They are playing from bottom to top and top to bottom is going to be against all authorities and it's going to be Corellius. Oh, look at that. And N-rated should... No, he missed his combo. He can take that out. It is possible to get the ward down if you're there on the spot, but he just I think just he had it. to take the. I think he had to level up the skill and then try and take it, and that's what probably delayed him that little bit longer. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case, and you know we'll see if any of these lane swaps are going to come into play. Soas is currently setting up towards that top lane. Uh, we we do see a small invader from N-rated, but uh, defensive start for most of Fnatic. You can see misfortune. Yellow star is down near the you bottom. Can, you can hear a lot of baiting from Virtual as well. He's using the taunt button quite heavily there against all. Authorities, so they're trying to. It's a good bit of camaraderie between the teams as it stands at the moment. Nothing coming out from these level one fights. So, Trevor, let's level up, let's sort ourselves out, let's go through the lanes that we're going to have here. It's been a long time since we talked about these picks. Well, in terms of the matchups, you know, you heard Crepo saying at the beginning, it's it's going to be up to one of these, these teams to decide if they can get an advantage with that 1v2. And with Nono being near this top lane, his support Corellius is now down with Schleyer taking the Wolf Camp. So an interesting start from against all authority, trying to get the, the you know, as many camps as is possible. And Corellius appears to be moving towards that middle or potentially top lane. So if a swap does come into play, you can see Schleyer is actually going bottom. So they're all over the place. They're going to put the AD carry and support in the middle. Schley is going to go 1v2 as Cho'Gath in the bottom, which is uh, which is perfect. It is great. He has the sustain. He can get health and mana back when he kills creeps. And they're going to let Renekton go 1v1 against Malphite. So I think against all authority have thought this out, and they've picked lanes that are going to benefit their team, because Diana's going to have a little bit more of a hard time farming, uh, a bit more mana reliant than what Cho'Gath will be. Oh, we'll see how this one works out for them. As it is, though, we see Virtual diving in there. Nobody picked up currently the blue buff at the moment. It is Cyanide that's going in towards their Slayer. Maybe he's trying to get a look towards him. He did pass a ward, so the rest of the team against all authorities are reacting to this one. They're going to try and bully Cyanide away from it. You can see the bottom lane end rated is there as well. While this is all happening, we've already seen Virtual. He's got in, stole away the blue buff from Fnatic. So as it is, Fnatic really want to get this blue buff because his Cyanide is going to fall behind drastically. He he couldn't take it because of the, the position of the against all authority members he had to fall back sona was there along with corralius Kanan was relatively close by and they had no idea where virtuals Jarvan was they they couldn't make an estimate you know a, an accurate guess because if they stayed committed it was going to be a four versus two in that situation as yellow star continued to farm so a buff already stolen away aaa have the advantage right now and we'll see how this lane matchup is hap is is gonna who it's gonna benefit Interestingly, the 1v1 in the top lane, it looks as though Freddy122 is already starting to pull a little bit ahead. He's pushed the lane very aggressively. He's got the ward there, and he's pushing Soas under the turret. Yeah, he's definitely pressuring the top lane. Let's have a look towards that jungle. Of course, it is going to be virtual. He is now coming back around towards that blue, and looking like he's going to take it for free here, which would give him a huge advantage in the jungle. Of course, Jarvan, he needed that start early on to be working out very well. It's going to really punish cyanide so the question is how will cyanide react to this one there it is that's the second blue buff being picked up by virtual he has left the two small minions though so he's going to be you know delaying that respawn whether that's an intentional uh you know intentional decision or simply reactionary because in rated yeah. and yellow star were going so aggressive under the tower uh, it does look like he's just gone back to clear out that camp with his demarcian standard and you know it's a, it's a good start for AA. It's what they needed to do. 
getting off to a good position, making sure they can take some advantages. And we heard it, you know, from the expert, Jarvan, if he starts to fall behind, it's difficult to come back. He needs to get a good start. And by getting the levels and the farm advantage, it's definitely going to help him. Well, as it is, the AD carries, they are staying very even, despite the fact they're in different lanes. You can see Peke, he's doing a good job, but as is Schleyer. Schleyer keeping up in that bottom lane. And Cho'Gath's one of those champions that can quite happily 2v1. Is he going to go full AP, though? He's only got four AP at the moment. He's obviously gone for the magic resist. And armor looks like in the runes. And he's got 71 attack damage as well. So I wonder if that might be uh, just for some extra last hitting in terms of his rune pages. Eight and then 8% 8 spell penetration. So we'll see how he decides to itemize because Cho'Gath is one of those champions that you can go in so many different routes. And this is something that we see more and more often from these lane swaps. That almost babysitting jungler comes in, leeches some experience, leeches some levels, and Cyanide is sniffing out some crocodile meat. He wants a new pair of boots. Oh, Freddy122 is going very aggressive here, creeps. but Cyanide is not going to go for like you mentioned, too many creeps. He's also got the Fortitude Pot as well, so it could well help him out. Be defensive. They have no idea where the jungler is. Now they can see him. He showed himself down that bottom lane, but he's just a long way behind now. So Cyanide going back. He's gone back to buy. And how is he really going to develop? How is he going to keep up here? It's going to be up to these ganks. The thing is, Cyanide and Virtual, neither of them have really put any pressure on a lane. You know, Virtual went in to leech some experience and, and just try to get to his Cataclysm state, which I think is going to have a more of an impact than that of Thunderclaws. Cyanide does have teleport though, so it, it's these situations where good ward placement is going to help Fnatic because they're going to be able to teleport to it. Pick is going to get stunned up, takes a lot of damage from Nono's cannon. And on the other side of the coin, Virtual, he's going to need to land some good player skill. Get that standard and Dragon Strike into a Cataclysm, lock somebody up, and then allow your team members to pick up the kill. Well, Cyanide's passing straight over a ward, so they're well aware that he's in that middle. Moonfall tries to pull in towards Corellia. Cyanide's going to get the flip down, but oh, what a great stun straight away from Nono. Turns it around, goes aggressive, and Peke couldn't get involved in that one. He was so, so close to being taken down, and Nono, of course, about to hit level six. His ultimate will be available. So as now having to rotate in towards this middle lane. That means that the top lane of Freddy is completely completely on his own at the moment to farm freely. Yeah, Peke in the middle had no health, he had no mana, so he couldn't re-engage even though Cyanide caught somebody. So as it decided to back to spend some of the money that he had farmed up, and noticing the pressure in mid lane was moving there to, you know, potentially help. He did have his ultimate, so if Nono and Corellius dived the tower, that unstoppable force would have landed and knocked them up in the air. But look at the build here from Soas, he's gone straight armor right now, so it is going to be helping him out as Cyanide goes aggressive, does look like he's going to get stunned up, but he gets the flash from Nono. He forced the flash from Nono, we see the ward also on the blue buff there from Freddy. So they're going to be aware of the fact that the blue buff will be spawning in a few moments. Remember, Freddy, uh, sorry, Virtual did get in there to start with, so I expect him to go straight there after this red buff. Freddy, of course, in his top lane has got that CS advantage currently building up over so as is going pure tank right now. So we'll see how that one develops. Freddy has got that aggression in there, has still got that fortitude pot in his pocket. Didn't even need to use it early on. No, hasn't used it at all, has got a minor advantage. It looks as though Freddy's sort of in control of this lane, and it is sort of a skill matchup. You know, whichever champion can get that advantage on one another, it's just a bruiser versus bruiser. They are bashing away and dealing next to no damage at this exact point in time. The amount of armor that Soaz has, it's reducing it completely. Cyanide is setting up for his blue buff, but he's in full vision of against all authority. And they can see Peke is going to come around. Peke wants to get a look at it, puts a ward straight on top of his head. Freddy shows himself. It's going to be a two for two. We also have the mid lanes coming across, and Cyanide had to smite it away there, so it means Peke will not be getting the blue buff. This makes life very difficult for Fnatic. You could see that Corellius and Nono were rotating towards that blue buff as well, so if any sort of engagement broke out, it was going to be two versus four. AAA are saying we want to play the numbers game. We're going to go for your buffs. We're going to go for map control and we're going to use numbers to use this to our advantage. So very good coordinated play from the members of Against All Authority. And well, we see a BF sword early on from Nono as well. So he's going to be doing a lot of damage in that mid. You've got to be careful of those shurikens hitting on towards Becca. You can see him dodging out of that one. As it is, he has got that farm advantage slightly. Had to go for the double Doran's rings though. So he's really not getting any items built up just yet. We saw Double Doran's Blade also from Yellow Star. He's farming out very well in that bottom lane, actually ahead in farm at the moment. And Cyanide picking up that red buff. Hasn't been able to come to help and get those ganks yet. Tried it in the middle, but failed. Freddy 1-2-2 two, two now, having a switch around and coming in towards the middle. It's looking like a dragon setup. It does look like every single person from Against All Authority is moving towards Drake. Peke is just trading back and forth with Freddy 1-2-2 two, two, and some very, very good ward placements here from Against All Authority means they'll know when Fnatic's setting up for this. 
are they going to engage? Because they've got four members very close by. Well, Cyanide has managed to steal many a dragon and buff in the past, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen this time around. It's Virtual that picks it up, and then it's going to be the first dragon going to against all authorities. But Soaz trying to take advantage of this one. He's farming out in between the lanes in that top lane. Blue buff, of course, he's going to be giving across to Schleyer now. That's going to help him out in that bottom lane. This is very, very good for AAA. It shows that they've, they've had a game plan coming into this matchup, and they're playing it. You know, they're not afraid of Fnatic. They're not letting that, uh, you know, that threat of, oh, it's Fnatic getting to them. They are playing for buffs, they are playing for Dragon. If you look at the ward control, they have way more vision in the river and on the Fnatic side of the jungle than, you know, Fnatic has. So they've got much more information to work with and they're simply playing to their strengths right now. In terms of CS, they are falling a little bit behind. You can see those CS numbers on the bottom of your screen and we haven't seen any engagements, you know, the, the, the fights. There hasn't really been any big battles between any of the lanes and that's what's going to be the telling difference here. Playing strategy is good, but you need to win the engagements. And there is the first tower of the game. It's going to go down. Fnatic will pick it up. The mid turret, though, is also very low. That's the advantage that they have. But the fact they've been working so heavily on towards that middle turret, losing the bottom one is nowhere near as bad as that middle. And we do see N-rated. He's making his way up. He's going to pass by a ward, though. I'm wondering if against all authorities are going to rotate straight towards him here. They may try and catch him out. Instead, no, they're going to play it wise and back away. It's going to be a 3v3 in that mid lane. Top lane advantage currently still with Freddy, but we do see the Giants belt. Some Cape almost built up by Soaz. And he's just going to be such a menace once he does get that Sunfire Cape up and running, just, you know, pushing the wave entirely. He's going to be able to start evening up those CS numbers that he is behind. He's sitting behind enemy, behind enemy lines right now, not even afraid of Freddy. He's just farming it up. He knows it's going to take so much to actually kill him and he's just going to back away, allow some uh, of his natural region on those potions to bring him back up to health. Yellow Star stayed down this bottom lane. Of course, Slayer can push waves very quickly on and Cho'Gath. It, in the middle lane, we do see Becker. He went aggressive onto Corralis, but immediately backs off. He's gone onto Nono. They're diving in towards him and he did dive in towards Nono. Nono, though, putting the pressure down on towards Pekka. Gets the stun. Corralis came around the side. Slayer's rotated as well. Now we see up the top here, it's Virtual diving in towards Soaz. He hasn't used that Cataclysm yet. Soaz is still trying to hold it out. First blood, meanwhile, falls in the middle lane. They're going to have to use his ultimate there. Soaz and stop one force trying to get out of it. Meanwhile, it was Pekka that went down in the mid lane. And Rated gets caught out with a rupture. Cyanide pressure. That that's the mid turret going down against all authorities suddenly switching on the aggression. And they landed every ability that they needed to. You can see Crescendo, you can see the Lightning Rush, uh, 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 Slicing Maelstrom as well as Feast. Everything is down. They stunned him, they locked him up, they picked it up. Cyanide's trying to defend one versus three, but without anybody else to back him up, I don't know if they're going to be able to do anything. Well, that's in a turret. It's gone down to half health. It's Corellius they went for there. He does go down. Yellowstar picks up the kill. Meanwhile, the top turret's going down. Cyanide taking very low. They can't pursue this one, but they're going to lose a Another turret, so it's two to one in turrets currently for against all authorities. They've got that lead right now and they're playing it out. As long as they can hold it and keep pressuring these lanes, getting more and more kills, that's definitely what's going to count. They've had very good map control and vision, and Schleyer being very sneaky. Is he going to get anybody? They're not hanging around here. Schleyer wants to try and force a position. He also has Freddy coming back with him, and you can see Virtual tries to engage. Oh, died there! Cataclysm, no, but Peke picks up the kill. Hit and run style. Can he get away? You can you can see immediately they're going to try and collapse it around him as it is. It's going to be Slayer that gets focused in there. Freddy 1-2-2 on towards end rated and that's going to be Slayer going down. It's two kills for Fnatic. They're going to keep pushing on towards this turret. Teleport from Cyanide there used perfectly in that middle lane. Managed to lock them out. Soas does not have unstoppable force. So if they want to pick another fight, it's not available for them. But the solar flare is there. If end rated wants to lock somebody up, you can allow x Pekka to dive forward. And a very aggressive Pekka. He got locked in with a Cataclysm. But because he had that ultimate cooldown refreshed, it allowed him to dive onto Nono again and pick up that kill under the tower, which is what started this whole balancing act that Fnatic have just done. So the snowball quickly back and forward there, and Fnatic taking some advantages and taking the gold lead once again. 3-1 in kills, 2-2 in turrets, and Nono back to farming, going for the Infinity Edge on Cannon. Which is what we tend to see out of Cannons because it's not your standard AD carry. And we do have actually a quick replay of that first blood, which I'm going to bring up on screen in just a second. And is, of course, in the middle lane. We were watching Topper's engagement happen. D Man, take us through. Well, you said he called it out and the rupture caught him. Beautiful silence, crescendo, slicing maelstrom, everything layered on top of each other. That's actually the danger that against the authorities have when they come to these team fights. As it was, they just 
just caught the one member there, but that could easily happen against the whole team later I, on. I didn't see if N-Rated was level 6 when that engagement began or not, but the Solar Flare came out and it was very late. If that had come down a couple of seconds earlier, it could potentially have saved Peke's life, but unfortunately it didn't, and it meant that AAA grabbed First Blood. Fnatic did bounce back very well, though. They re you know, evened out the turrets, they got some kills, and they've completely you know, mashed up this game. They're only 200 gold behind. So we see the Crocodile versus the Rock going on right now. Really, who is winning out that fight? Sunfire Cape has been picked up already by Soaz. He's going full tank. We can see also, looks like Freddy's probably going to go for that Sunfire Cape. May even be a Warmox, who knows uh, which one he's going to stack towards first. But he's ahead in CS, and he's, he's going to be more damaging. And he's got the tower down as well. So in terms of who's winning, Freddy 1-2-2 two, two for sure. Corellius oh, gets Corellius. slowed. The ultimate coming out there from N-Rated. Didn't quite catch Karen Corellius. Blue buff was being fought over at the same time. I think Slayer did manage to take that one away. Wasn't sure if they smited it away. They pressured it. We do see Freddy starting to position himself, though, but he's walking past a ward. They might be ready for him. They may well pincer on towards Freddy here, and he immediately backed away. Yeah, Soaz does have vision, though. He's going to start moving up towards Freddy. Freddy's just going to slice and dice to safety, getting a little bit further away. And at the moment, you know, the amount of presence that Renekton's going to offer in these team fights will be huge if they can drag them out. The question is, can against authority split and avoid all of that focus damage from the solar flare, from the bullet time, from Diana diving in? If they can split and, and avoid it, they can do well. But if they just get blown up, Ooh. that huge CS advantage that Freddy's built up is not going to be very important at all. They are split apart here. As it is, Fnatic are going to regroup. They may well get caught out before they get a chance to, though. Peke trying to throw out the poke. And against the authorities, they're just saying, you know, we're going to take tactical advantage here. We're going to force you away. They're going to try and catch them out. And they're going to push straight in for the inner turret. Very well maneuvered by against the authority. And the rupture from oh, going to be the unstoppable force. It's going to come in from the side there. Does manage to catch on towards no -No, But the crescendo and slicing mouth from follows it straight up. Freddy wants you to does take the turret down. And now they turn back around. But no, no, is going to go down to Soas. And that is sent against all authorities in disarray. Freddy wants you to try and lay the damage down. But it's not enough. And that's going to be the bullet time just catching down. Down. One there towards the end there. Freddy wants you two drops. Corellius is dropped. It's a three for zero exchange from Fnatic. All they did, a four for zero, sorry. They lost the turret, but it doesn't matter. They're going to turn it around. They may even catch Slayer out here. He's going to come around the side there. Doesn't matter. Inner turret will go down. Very nicely played by Fnatic. Fnatic decide that they want this tower. They're going to shove it down and that engagement from the side. Solar Flare landing, slowing everybody. Malphite knocking everyone up into the air. And just that, that focus from Fnatic was there. They picked the target. They dove onto him, stuck on him, and managed to get it. They still haven't taken the inter... Oh, as I said, that they just finished it down. Slayer trying to run some interference, but it's just not going to be enough. And Slayer doing as much as he can to try and prevent them from backing off so quick, but it's not going to happen. And currently, that ultimate layer, and we talked about it for against the authority, but it's worked so well for Fnatic there. You know, like you mentioned, the unstoppable force from the side, it was kind of like the perfect position for them. It was, and initially I actually thought Slayer had done very well. He threw the rupture out, which slowed Fnatic down, but it was a couple of seconds early. They didn't have the full vision as AA have started the second dragon of the game. If that rupture had knocked them up and slowed them down like that one has, it, it allows them to get that safe dragon. In the previous engagement, it would have been a safe tower, but unfortunately not landing the rupture means Fnatic could engage with the fight and then you know trade mid tower for mid tower so where do they stand right now they've lost two big team fights we're seeing double giants belt being picked up by cyanide now why just you know stack it up right there a couple of thousand gold as it stands freddy also well off the side here hasn't got teleport if he wants to join back this fight they're going to keep pressuring on towards the inhibitor turret and they have a great initiation once that unstoppable force is back and no no is missing as well they seen him he was farming in the bottom lane so they know they've got a couple of seconds of free damage yellow star's got that bloodthirster she's got the impure shots is going to put about 50 percent of the turret damage down the presence of Freddy from the side is enough to scare them away and Fnatic decide to back off. But a very good play from Fnatic, realizing they had the advantage. And look at them dropping the wards. Look at the vision in and around that middle lane for the Fnatic members. And they did get half the health off the inhibitor turret in the middle already. Very nicely done, Freddy. Just simple positioning mechanics there, really, from Fnatic. Playing the numbers, and they knew they were in a stronger position just to bully them out of it. They didn't have the ultimates available as well, so ballsy, ballsy play. As it is against all authorities, they did pick up the dragon which has kept them in it with the gold 26,200 to 26,701 though and kills four fanatic currently and three three in turrets and the problem here for against all authority is they haven't 
pick to fight on their terms. They've been caught out, you know, they've been in a position where Fnatic has jumped onto them in both occasions and they have lost because of that. If, however, they pick an engagement, they could win it. No, no, has been jumped on by Soaz. He is at the top and he's had to use his ultimate to try and stun Soaz on the turret. He was worried. He was expecting a potential dive. I'm not too sure whether he could have had enough to finish him off there, but it does burn that ultimate. Look how scared he is. He is so worried about that top. He sees the rest of the team starting to maneuver up there, immediately backs away from the turret. Well, with Soaz is full combo right now with his ultimate, he's got all maxed out ground slam, maxed out seismic shot. He's sitting close to around 800 or 900 points of damage, but the reason that Soares didn't go aggressive is Ignite was not available. So even if he did, he would not have that last couple of ticks of Ignite to close it out. So he decided to back away. He got the slicing maelstrom for free, and it's allowed Fnatic to close out this top tower. And another turret goes down. It's 4-3. All of the outers now down. We see Cyanide off the side as well. He's getting his free farm split push going on down that bottom lane. He's 1-0-5. We do see the Lich Bane now completed by Peke, so we're starting to see a bit of a power up from Fnatic. And it's sort of that, that, that build. If you do go for the Lich Bane very early, you need a little bit of ability power for it to really hit home. And the Double Doran's Lich is something we see out of his Twisted Fate relatively often as well. So I want to see what he goes with uh, next in terms of his itemization. 126 CS to the 123 of Schleyer's Chogat. They are relatively even. Our AD carries are even, but the big story in terms of lane presence is that Renekton. And Freddy 122 clearly winning his lane. And the question is, can he convert it to team fight presence? Well, he has got that Brutalizer in there now, so the damage is starting to stack up. And the question is, can he lay it down in the right place? Did manage to pick up some kills, but got cleared out towards the end and again Fred against all authorities very much split all across the map trying to pick up everything they can blue buff goes across towards Slayer Slayer with that rod of ages and giant's bolt and rest what's he gonna go ward next is he is he gonna go for a warmog or will it be a Rylers maybe in there could be anything I mean he's, he's playing AP Chogan so who knows you know what there's so many different possibilities that he he could go he has teleport so if he wants to go for something like a sunfire cape which is the, the giant's belt mm -hmm. and the, the chain vest they'll directly upgrade to. It allows him to split push and teleport into a team fight more effectively. He's got a lot of AoE with his abilities, etc. So that could help out. He could even go for something like a Randian's Omen, which is going to help against Renekton, and Jarvan and Ken and diving in, movement speed, attack speed, eventually later in the game. But it, it just depends on, on how these, these next few team fights go. So, AAA are grouping up in the, the jungle of Fnatic and starting to move forward, but they're still on top of a ward and Fnatic know that it's coming. They know they see Cyanide backing off and nothing is gained from it. They try to collapse in towards Cyanide, but he is well gone before it even happens. So it's going to be No-No showing himself down the bottom lane and immediately the pings are there and they're aware of it and they're going to try and shove back in towards that mid lane. Remember, they've already taken half the hit points off that inhibitor in that mid lane. So against all authorities, they've got to be so cautious they don't leave that middle corridor open. And they need to be very, very careful of Yellow Star's misfortune. If you look at the items in the hands of Against All Authority, there's, there is some armor across the board, but there's not a massive amount of armor built up for really anybody. Oh, and so the has last Whisper has been completed. So has caught out there. He has got an unstoppable force available. Doesn't want to burst it just yet. Bullet time had to get used out. And the ultimates are being burned around. But you do see the teleport coming in. Against All Authority just get melted where they stand. Virtual is going to get dropped. The Ignite will finish him off there. Tries to get away. It's Pekka that picked up the kill there. No, no, taken very low. He He's having to run towards the turret. Yellow Star is just going to continue pursuing his set. They turn towards the turret, and wow, they're going to get melted. Peke dives in. He picks up the kill, and well, against all authorities, they thought they'd managed to get the situational advantage, but it was not to be. It was another 4 for 0 trade, and the inhibitor. The solar flare caught them completely off guard. Sina, had, uh, Soez rather, was out of the fight. He couldn't really do anything. Schleyer's well out of position, and if Fnatic decided to chase, he's in trouble. Uh, Peke flashes on there. If he can Managed to get that Crescent Strike, forces the flash away from Slayer. Slayer's gonna have to chase, but he's running through the wards. They know exactly where he's going. He has nowhere to run, and Peke dives in. Could he turn? Hasn't got the, he has got the feast available, but it doesn't matter. He can tries to barrier out this one. He tries to get the shield down, tries to land the rupture. Lich Pain procking up from Peke there. He's gonna land the hit. Oh, and Rated tries to chase it through. He's still running, but he's running in towards Yellow Star and a turret, and now he's got nowhere to go. They're just gonna slowly drive him down. The question is, will he delay long enough against the authorities? They're going to try and position for Baron here. Have they delayed Fnatic enough? That is the question. They've got quite a bit of damage, but you can see Soaz is getting into position. His ultimate is not available if he does decide to engage, but he might be able to just run some interference. You can see him running in there, putting some damage 
time. done because Baron is hitting very, very hard. Against Authority, cannot survive. Teleport is not available for Cyanide either, and AAA are going to back away. They do not have the damage to survive both Soaz and Baron bashing on their faces. They had to back away. They couldn't deal with that one instead, but they couldn't turn on towards Soaz either. They don't really have the burst damage available to just take him down. And now the rest of Fnatic, Unstoppable Force used up. Just try and bait them in, keep them there a little bit longer. Bullet time around the side that catches three members perfectly at full volume. And Cyanide now in there. Soaz has gone down. Can they turn the damage? Cyanide goes down against all authorities with two kills so far, but Yellowstar is going to be picking them off from range. Can they dive it? Cataclysm on towards Yellowstar. They're trying to drop Yellowstar so, so low. No, no, still hangs around. He's just about to survive. And Rated Last Man Standing gets one, but he can't get another. And it's a four for one exchange for against all authorities. Peke's going to come in. He wants to clean up, but he's got to run away from the big dinosaur that is Slayer. Terrible call from Fnatic. They dove in two versus two. He's dealing a lot of damage to Slayer, though. Can he pick up the kill? Nobody else from AAA can really pick a fight. He's going to carry on. He's chasing. going in. Lands he's across the slice. He gets one. Can he get the second? He's going to go towards Corellius when he manages to clean out one, but they're all backing away. Nobody wants to deal with Peke. He dodges out of the Crescent Strike, and he doesn't have the ultimate reset. So Peke, he's still lingering. He wants to get the reset. He's going to get a second. He lands it on towards Freddy. He can't quite dive in. He has got his ultimate available now, but he hasn't got enough to tank it down. And well, Peke just, he can see the quadra kill in front of his eyes, but it wasn't to be. Now, nah, unfortunately, Fnatic, they stuck around too long. They engaged one versus two, one versus three, then just kept throwing them in. Peke, if he lands oh. it, so close, so, so close. If that had landed, it would have been a dead Slayer. He's got that Lich Bane on. Uh, he has the Needlessly Large Rod as well. And if he checks the uh, Slayer, you know, nope. not this time. AAA are holding on by the skin of their teeth. Bad calls from Fnatic cost them that massive team fight, but they will pick up Dragon. Well, Soaz really was the one that started it, chained it all off. One by one they went in there. As it is, though, we do see the Dragon being picked up here. And slowly but surely, Fnatic regain control once again. We do have the blue buff being taken away. Oh, mid lane, the meanwhile, they're diving in in the mid lane. If we could check that out, it was Soaz that was being chased out there. Has got unstoppable force available. For the rest of Fnatic, not going to climb it out, though. And well, no, no, it's going to show himself once again down that bottom lane. He could get caught out here. The thing, the last time this happened as well, Fnatic decided to just push that lane and try to pick up, uh, you know, some damage in that inhibitor turret. So we'll see if they decide to do something similar. No, no, is starting to back off, but Fnatic aren't necessarily grouped up as tight knit as they need to be to push any of these objectives. Well, as it stands, we do see, of course, that inhibitor was down. No, no, is going to back off. And we're waiting for the inhibitor to respawn. It should be up soon. Against the authorities have hung on, like you said, they've hung on, they've withered the storm, they're 6-3 down in turrets, but they are not down and out just yet. As it stands though, I think if a full team combo were, were to be landed from Fnatic, they'd definitely turn this back around again. Yeah, you, the team fight presence is a lot stronger from Fnatic, and it's exactly like Crepo was saying in the, in, you know, the opening stages here when we had that pause. Once Fnatic jump in and dive onto somebody, if AAA do not split oh, they're well up and out of survive, position. They're I well out of position here. They're just going to pile straight up the bottom lane. You can see they're all backing off now suddenly. They're desperately going back, but they are too far gone. And they can just tank this one through. There's going to be the inhibitor to turn it down. They've only just hit the fountain. They're trying to teleport in. You can see that's going to be cyanide in there, but the inhibitor is already exposed, and they're just going to keep pouring onto it. They're going to try and dive. It's going to be the Cataclysm. They caught out Yellowstar, but they're not putting the damage on towards Yellowstar. Instead, they're focused focused across, and Yellowstar's still free of the back here, he's just laying down all the damage, pointing the smack down, and there's the unstoppable force, Slayer's gonna get dropped down, it's a triple kill for Miss Fortune, Yellowstar just sat at the back laughing at against all authorities there, he picks up the quadra kill. Amazing stuff. Great play. They managed to secure the inhibitor. Going to carry on chasing onto the Nexus turrets now. As they put damage down on the first turret, Fnatic are in such a strong position in this particular game. It's definitely going to be finishing it. Once they got that advantage, once they had those team fight wins, there was nothing AAA could do about it. And there it is. Fnatic are going to take the victory. It's 19 6 in kills, but honestly, it was a much closer fight than the kill count. It was Big Let's. And there it is. After such a long delay, Fnatic do pick up the win there.
and it was just a comfortable team victory. They really, once it, once it pulled into the team fights, they were so close-knit. They knew exactly what they had to do. There they are. You can see them going across against the authority. They had great banter between them. Of course, French player Yellow Star in there to, can uh, talk to them in their own language, but uh, Freddy 122 won't have a clue what they're on about. And all, <laughs> all of the XAAA members, I mean, this name goes back for such a long time. Really, really well played from Fnatic. Their team fight power is just that much stronger, and that's what helped them win the game. Well, we are going to get an expert view. We have Crepo over on the analyst desk along with Joe and Jay. And so we'll get to see what they thought of that team composition and how it all worked out. Thanks a lot, Demon. So, Crepo, let's break that one down a little bit. Uh, we talked about the whole fact that Peke was going to be in their faces the entire time with Diana, and that's really what happened a lot of the time as well. Well, first off, uh, let's say that they surprised me because I was I was thinking they would lean counter Diana with Cho'Gath, but they sent in bot instead, which is actually pretty good because it's very hard to burst the Cho'Gath down, and Leona and Misfortune doesn't push that well which means they, they get a pretty good lane if they can deny farm from uh, PK mid with the uh, Ken and Sona combo. I think that it didn't go as planned. Uh, I think Diana got a still a little bit too much farm from Ally King. And the Jarvan as well was, like, early game didn't get any ganks off. And as we said before, if Jarvan yeah. doesn't get that snowball rolling, he'll be weaker because he'll be so squishy that he'll fall to the base stats. Damage of, like, a Malphite and a Misfortune ulti is pretty much enough to take him to, like, what, 45, 35%? And then he's useless in a fight. He can't even go in anymore. So we prepared some uh, replays, actually Definitely. a couple of replays from that one again. There were some uh, real highlights to go through. Uh, but Jason, why don't you take us through the first one? Well, um, before we actually get full into this replay, Krupa, you wanted to start off talking about what happened previously right before this that led into this fight. Yeah, basically, uh, it's, a, it's a story of uh, about mid lane zone power. Whenever people go for objectives at the side of the map, they leave their mid lane exposed. And this is what happens time and time. Both teams did it once. Uh, first time, Fnatic pushes, uh, pushes mid lane while... Uh, AA actually, AA start, actually all started. AA pushes down tier one tower mid. They push one wave too far, which means they get caught by uh, the Volibear hunt with Diana. You can't run from Fnatic's team come because they will hunt you down. So they push them back. AA splits to the sides, mid lane exposed. Fnatic groups up, pushes back tier one tower again. AA can't respond, tries to defend, loses a few people. That's a mistake. Now we're now what's happening now on replay is about five to six minutes later, where Fnatic will attempt to get a Drake or a Dragon and uh, AA responds correctly by grouping mid, entering from mid lane brush, and then zoning Fnatic out. And you can roll the replay now and we can check that oh, out. That, that was actually, uh, well, that, that one we kind of want to skip over because we oh. wanted to have you explain that one a little bit more, but the, oh, the one we were going to show right? yeah, 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 was yeah. where they chased There's the Malphite replays. down. Yeah. <laughs> There's too many. Can't yeah. hold all these replays. Yeah, catchphrase for this replay, like they say, never chase a singe. Dude, never chase a Malphite. Let's like, just yep. let it roll. Let's we'll so get this on your screen and just show you well, exactly why that uh, ends up coming true. So basically, yeah, Malphite overextends. They think they ca catch him. The Jarvan Flaktos misses. The, the, not, not enough knockups on Malphite. He gets really low. MF zones. So if you can pause it right there, we can check what what's going on. Basically, Malphite didn't get knocked up by Jarvan Flag combo, which means he didn't get bursted. He still has his ulti and is on 20%. Doesn't matter, though. It's his ulti. The be most beautiful part of this was Yellow Stars blowing his MF ulti just to get that little doubt in AA's comp. But now they think all the ultis are blown. Let's go in. But they go into a choke point. If you go into a choke point against Malphite and Diana, you're going to have a bad time. And Volibear comes in with the TP now, and I, I don't think the replay needs much explaining now, because just let it roll and you'll see Malphite ulti going in, boom. Diana going, boom. Meanwhile, MF is untouched, and you can't run. They will hunt you down. Even Leona ulti. Just, just yeah, beautiful. Too far. AA took it too far. Was it a mistake there uh, after seeing that misfortune all to go through? I mean, they obviously didn't have vision on that side, so they didn't know exactly what was waiting in that brush, which, you know, at the start was four men. Like you said, Cyanide actually TP'd into that fight there, into that war in the brush. When, you know, from your point of view, making that call, when you saw the misfortune ulti, is it a case of going because that ultimate's not there, or is it a case of, well, at least misfortune, and then probably the support at least is there as well? Let's not fight it. Basically, it all started with the correct call by uh, a Malphite was at front. Not too many people were near. Burst him down. If you can burst, you can burst the Malphite down with yep. Jogaf Feast and then the Jarvan knockup. Because if you have knockups, you can keep him CC'd. Problem, knockup misses. Jarvan spells are on cooldown. Then, that was fine up till then. They can back off. I just don't think anybody in AAA uh, was the shot caller. They need like the one guy saying, guys, this is too far. Back off, back off. And they didn't call that. They kept like solo queue instincts perhaps chasing down reaching for the kill. Maybe they felt they were behind and they had to make something happen. And then they ran into the brush and like, 
you can't go into a choke point against a full AOE blow up comp. It just doesn't work. So that was the first replay that we had. The other one, a uh, little bit of a different scenario in this top lane, though. Yeah, it was right after against Authority tried to go for a little bit of a, a sneaky Baron, and they're running away. And crap, we were watching this all yeah. together, and you were just amazed at what was happening. And uh, we're gonna get the you know the replay on your screen. You kind of uh, show us exactly what happens in here and uh, why it was actually a really good fight for AA. Again, on the mindset, AA feels like they have to make something happen, so they went for the Baron. Now they're backing off, but and they're low. So you, you can see it right here. If you pause and you get up the mini map. See where uh, where Soaz is. He, he's so desperate to catch them, and he knows his team is coming. His team is probably shouting in his ears like, "Yeah, we're following up. We're following up." So he doesn't check the map. But this, he's there two screens away. By the time Malphite CC is over, he's alone, and that's what's gonna happen now. If you let it roll, they'll just burst down the Malphite. The knockups land. Stun comes in, and then crescendo. Good. But at the same time, MF with a crazy bullet time from the side, choking them down. Cyanide thinks, "Yeah, we can clean this up." And then the beautiful spread. Look now, they dodging the Leona ulti. So beautiful. Like, amazing. Leona misses the E. Virtual still sticks around because he knows his team needs help. And now they calm down. 3, 2, 1. Turn on the MF. Cannon ulti barely touches him. Enough for stun lock. MF drops. Sona comes in with a little heal. Take down Leona. Just doesn't have enough damage. And look at the HPs. This is a sign you play the team fight really, really well because they all get away on 20% 20, 20 HP. And, and really props to AA for playing the team fight so well because it could have gone really, really sour. But the biggest... I wouldn't call it a mistake because it's easy, like, if you're sitting here, yeah, the mouth I went too early, but if you're in that game, <laughs> if you're in that game and you're, play, and you're playing that, then, yeah, it, it gets a lot harder. Yeah, and then we saw Xpeke actually came back around and tried to pick up a couple more kills, but luckily they escaped mostly with uh, most of their hides intact. Oh, yeah, I want to do one more highlight to, uh, to Freddy. Uh, I, we didn't show the replay here, but every time Diana came in and she used the, the, the arc, the arc skill shot, most people will try and dodge that to the left, right? No, no, Freddy, he just dodged it to the front. He just went in it and it went all around him. And that, like, did that three times and that, yeah. I, I can't stand for the fact that Crepo was like, that's how you dodge Diana. <laughs> yep. Today I learned, Today I learned. I learned, I learned, I learned it. I wrote it down, I wrote it down, because it, it was beautiful. It was really, really beautiful. Well, congratulations to Fnatic for another victory here in the EU LCS. We're going to hand it over to the stage where Shox is waiting with Soaz from Fnatic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so as now, AAA came into this one with a plan. They switched up the lanes, but you still dismantled them. How did you do it? Well, uh, we asked Peke if we needed to lane swap as well, and he said it was fine. So we just play standard with normal picks, and we played our game. Did you feel that you didn't have a need for, no for special picks against this team? Mm, the thing is, it's always risky to a strategy as we did against EG. Like, it's 50-50 and we prefer to play standard against team we are comfortable against. So, that's it. <laughs> Very impressive play yesterday uh, with that Blitzcrank top. People were raving all about you, so we need to pick your brain for the aspiring top laners over there. What does it take to be an amazing professional top player? Mm. <laughs> I guess, like, I have many put a, a big pool of champion and that's what make me not play better but I, I can adapt more than other top play now maybe and for lane swap as well it helped where do you rank yourself in Europe as top laner who's above you who's under you mm, I would say top five top three can we get names I would say Wicked and me are pretty close. Okay, of course, uh, Fnatic is doing great as a team as a whole, not just you in particular. What is it that distinguishes you from the teams that are out of the top four and makes you the strongest at the moment? What makes you the strongest team at the moment? What quality? Um, I think we have really good team play as a team. Our early is not that good, but we are improving since last week. And yeah, it's especially team fights, and that's it. Thank you very much, Soaz. We're going into a short break right now in just a second. But don't forget today's Twitter question. Which player has impressed you the most in the LCS so far and why? It could be Soaz. Send us your answers at LOL Esports, hashtag LCS. And feel free to tweet us any questions you have from Crepo from EG, who's at the analysis desk. So we're going into a short break. When we come back, it's Dragonborns looking for blood, as are the Copenhagen Wolves. Don't go anywhere.